tears and count its many tears while we always of sorrow with the poor. There's a song that will linger forever in our ears. Oh, hard times come again. The Roaring Twenties was a time of great contrast. With little regulation on business and banking, great wealth was accumulated on one end of the economic spectrum, while the farmers and working men and women were struggling to make ends meet on the other. America's optimism was fading, and with the economic crash, devastation came for millions of our citizens. As one of our interviewees remembers, only a young child in the early 30s, his family had had to move out into the country in an old house, which he thought was just wonderful. He also remembers his daddy telling his mother to come on and eat supper, and she said for them to go ahead that she had nibbled all afternoon while she was cooking. Only later did he realize what had happened. She had sacrificed her food for the children and his father. And that family was lucky. They had a house, but so many others did not. Or if they did, the houses were usually in deplorable conditions. In the cities and along railroads, shanty towns went up. People living in shipping crates, tar paper shacks, anything that sheltered them from the wind and rain. Even nature seemed to conspire against the people. The winds in the nation's midsection began to blow the soil away, dislodging even more of the people. Long unemployment lines formed in all cities and towns across America. Thus, the makeshift shelters kept growing. Hoovervilles, they called the shanty towns, in outrage against President Hoover, who had done too little, they thought, to prevent the crash. It was not until Franklin Delano Roosevelt became president that the government became deeply involved in trying to restore life to the American people, trying to restore the American dream. His New Deal policy, initiated in part in the first hundred days of his presidency, established work projects that created and upgraded our nation's infrastructure, roads, bridges, recreation facilities, and the like. As one cartoonist put it, the New Deal lexicon was the WPA, the TVA, the PWA, and the AAA. Then another cartoonist showed Roosevelt's idea that fear was the first dragon that needed to be slain, but an even larger one was deflation. And yet another was to show that the New Deal was on track. Shortly, there were signs and cartoons everywhere showing the advent of each new project. Even maps were displayed prominently to show where projects were in progress. This gave encouragement to the people and helped dispense with the terrible dragons and replace them with hope. Another aspect of the New Deal was to create over a hundred resettlement villages. One such village, and perhaps the most extensive, was the Pine Mountain Valley Resettlement Project. Located about 90 miles south of Atlanta and about 15 miles west of Warm Springs, Georgia, lies a peaceful valley covering more than 12,000 square acres. The valley is back to the north by Pine Mountain and to the south it is defined by Oak Mountain. These mountains are the last vestiges of the great Appalachian mountain range one of the oldest mountain ranges in the world. This valley has been inhabited by Native Americans all the way back to archaic times. The white settlers were not making inroads and acquiring land until the latter half of the 18th century. This was wilderness land, and the earliest dwellings for the white settlers were log structures. But by the 1820s, this valley and surrounding lands were being turned into both plantations and small farm holdings. 
The land was initially fertile, but with little management to maintain fertility, especially with such heavy feeder crops as corn and cotton, over time the soil was depleted of its nutrients. In fact, by 1929, at the time of the great stock market crash, the land of the valley was exhausted. Much of it was returning to second or third growth forest of little commercial value. This valley, to a large extent, was symbolic of the whole nation, its land and its commerce, each having been used for fast gain at the expense of its people and its fertile lands. Even before Franklin Delano Roosevelt became president, he knew of the area's land and its destitute condition. He first came to Pine Mountain in the early 1920s when he started visiting the nearby Primitive Health Spa in Warm Springs, Georgia. The healing waters there offered him relief from the ravages of polio, which he had contracted in 1921. In 1927, he even bought farmland nearby and began his personal experiment in reclaiming the land. One of his largest efforts, which continues even today, was replanting the longleaf pine, a valuable timber crop of an indigenous tree that had lost most of its native habitat, and thus the concept of using new and sustainable agricultural practices and building homes and businesses for the resettlement of displaced American people came into being. There's a pale drooping maiden who toils her life away with a worn heart whose better days are o'er. Though her voice would be merry, tis sighing all the day. Roosevelt sat on the Pine Mountain Ridge facing south with Oak Mountain in the distance. He studied the ragged land before him, land cut by a few dirt roads and farm trails. There his vision of what could be came into focus. On the ridge of Pine Mountain, the large stone lodge went up. Along with the building, there is a beautifully terraced patio, which can even now be used as a small amphitheater. The view from the back of the patio, overlooking the valley, is a major tourist attraction for the area. But as the building was in its planning stages, much activity was happening in the valley. There, planners, surveyors, architects, agronomists, and technicians were arriving daily to help plan and transform this small, beautiful valley into a village where people could work and live with dignity and freedom. So now a few voices of the settler's children tell their memories. What they observed, how they lived, what their parents gave. Even though most of their voices are scattered throughout our country, a few are still here. It is in part their collected memories that have added life and authenticity to a story of a time and its people, a very particular place and time that are slipping away from us, almost unawares. They are all in their 60s or beyond, but their memories are real and true. Here they were brought by parents dispossessed of their way of life by the Great Depression of 1929. And here those few have remained or returned to the valley to help preserve their memories of home. This is their story as well as the valley story, a story of resettlement, endurance, and change. My father was working for the railroad, but Ben, he didn't have a lot of senior yard that finally caught up with him. And he went to work for the WPA, driving a truck for him. And one day, Daddy seen a post on the Bolson board there that they were going to start this project down here, and he read it and went home. He talked to Mama about it that night, 
and the next day he went up and made application. Uh, it wasn't but a few weeks that he came down, and I believe it was in February of 35, and the first group, I think it was around 50 or 60 people, they uh, arrived in Hamilton on a train at uh, about noon. There was three army trucks there and a couple of soldiers, uh, three soldiers and an officer, and they, the three soldiers showed Daddy and the other two other people how to drive those trucks because <laughs> they was the old army vehicles they called Liberty Truck. They had, had solid rubber tires and they would change rubber. My grandfather had lost his job. Her father had lost his job at Foot and Davies Printing Company and they lost their 200 acre farm up, up in the mountains of North Georgia because they couldn't pay the taxes. So they heard about, about this place and decided they would come down here. My grandfather was skilled, so he became the bookkeeper of the uh, project. My father was a surveyor and he worked for the government and he was brought here from the Indian Springs project to uh, lay out the plots, the, the land lot areas, uh, the roads, and to build the water system. Word of the resettlement project went out through posters, newspapers, and word of mouth. People with various talents were looked for to fill all the needs of a working town or village. They needed surveyors to help lay out the land plots and roads. They needed heavy equipment operators who helped terrace the land for appropriate drainage and better farming practices and for the laying of pipelines. They needed technicians to help establish the electric grid. And of course, they needed many laborers, and they invited farmers as well. Thus, the families were selected. They packed their goods, and they began the journey coming from all over the area, Atlanta, Macon, LaGrange, and a few from our own Harris County. The children remember their journeys well. I remember coming up the mountain uh, toward Tip Top, and that we were in an old Model A or Model T or something, sitting in the front seat between Mother and Daddy, and Daddy said, uh, do you think that this old car is going to make it up that hill? I said, don't worry, Daddy, it'll flatten out when we get there. <laughs> <laughs> the day that we moved, it was, like I say, on a Monday, and it was a cold Monday, because Mother and Dad was killing their hogs that day. And we were in school, they had to get a neighbor to come to the school to get us out of the school. And she told the driver when they, they drove up in the yard, she asked what they were doing there. And they said, we come to move you to Pine Mountain Valley. And she says, I can't go today. I'm killing, we're killing hogs. And I've got all this meat to work up. They said, go ahead, we'll do it. And the drivers come in the house, started taking the beds down, the curtains down, and everything else, and they loaded those trucks. Mother didn't have to turn her hands to it because she was busy in the kitchen. Yes, I remember my first trip into the valley. The day we moved, it was on a Monday, December the 13th, 1937. The things that happened on our way, when we was coming under the underpass, coming up to Tip Top, I had told my second, my sister next to me that uh, not to worry that if we get here and we don't like it, we can always go back because I've been watching the way. We, I know how to get back. But I don't believe either one of us would have made it because I was on a 12 and she was on a 9. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Jack Huggins remembers the trip into the valley. His father drove an old vehicle with the few belongings they had. He and his brother sat quietly in the cab. They were excited. But on the trip down, a major bearing burned out. His father thought for a while and then sent the boys to borrow tools from a farmhouse some distance back. People would loan you tools and stuff back then, he said as an aside. Young Jack watched in amazement then as his father cut the tongue from his shoe and stuffed the bearing case with it. To his amazement, 
The truck then lurched forward and they arrived at their new home. And as another aside, he wondered if his father ever replaced the shoe tongue in that bearing case. He couldn't remember it ever being replaced. These stories and many others echo the whole nation in its movement during those troubled times. But again, the work projects were underway throughout the states and in Alaska. Our national and state parks were being upgraded and or established. Our valley settlers were privy to the extensive work done here in the area. The FDR State Park, Lake Delano and its campsites were constructed and remain one of Georgia's most visited attractions. The Liberty Bell Pool was built at the same time and has been in continuous use each summer since construction. Both local residents and thousands of visitors utilize the park annually. The walking trails on the Pine Mountain Ridge extending from Tip Top, now where Callaway Country Store stands, all the way to the Warm Springs Hospital constitute another of Georgia's major tourist attractions. And as the president continued his planning and building, the settlers of Pine Mountain Valley kept coming into their new dream. Those settlers had skills to bring with their dreams. They knew how to grow their own food, and they knew how to survey the land, or how to teach their children to read and write and love their country. They learned how, with some help and hope, to triumph over hard times. remember when we used to walk to the cannon plant in the summer barefooted in that dusty road and mm -hmm. Roosevelt would come driving by mm -hmm. in his car with no secret service men and he would stop and talk to us. Yeah, I didn't get that. My recognition of him so was when I was sitting on the front porch several times when he was down he'd come by the drive by the house and I was always waving at him, but remembering the times that he sat out there in that car and watched us with those little old pageants, it'll be a thing that I'll remember from now on. Right. As you know, this is one of my favorite spots in the United States. I'm very proud of what you're doing what you children are doing and what your parents are doing. And I wish that a great many people from all over the country could come here and see with their own eyes the success of this Pine Mountain Valley. There would be fewer people who scoff and ridicule if they could see this with their own eyes. City of Catala, Georgia, 4th of July, 1935. Dear Florence, this seems to have been a perfect 4th of July. Even the weather has been ideal. I worked real hard until 9 o'clock this a.m. Then we closed the store and went up to Pine Mountain Valley above Hamilton to a barbecue, speaking, and three ball games. A special train came down from Atlanta besides a mob from Harris and Muscogee counties. The object of it was to familiarize the public with what the government is doing. The progress is almost unbelievable. Lots of love, John Davis. But other of the children's activities and memories are even more vivid than seeing the president. Charlotte Smith Wisness, for example, remembers her daily rambles through the summer landscape. And I love the valley. I explored the woods and the mountains and the streams. I went all over the place, everywhere. I mean, I, one thing I remember, I made a shredded wheat backpack and use cloth to make straps to hold on my, my back and filled a Clorox bottle with water, uh, hung, hung it on my belt, 
and I would go marching all over the woods and up on the mountain with my cousins. we haven't got around to is the people in Pine Mountain Battle was heavy in different sports. We even had a golf course at one time, but baseball was the main thing and then basketball was right behind that and then they had volleyball, volleyball and everything going on and we had some good players. Uh, the, one thing, the basketball team played the original Boston Celtics in the gym up here in the valley. And I went to that game. <laughs> uh, I think Ray played in the game. Go ahead, Ray. Go ahead. Tell us about the ball game. You played in it. I run myself to death. <laughs> <laughs> it was kind of rough playing against a bunch of professionals. Of course, it was all in fun anyway, but uh, we tried our best to score and beat them, but there was no chance of doing that. We also played a team from uh, Georgia Tech there, uh, a bunch of uh, football stars. So uh, the season old got up a basketball team. We played them one time. And I remember that real well. One of the, one of the All-America guys was playing against him out of garden. And I uh, can't remember what his name was. He went on to be a pro ball player. <clears throat> And I was trying to get the ball away from him, and he opened his mouth, and I stuck my finger right down his throat. <laughs> he was, <laughs> I apologize. Soon after the initial planters came into the valley making their assessments, workers began to arrive. The engineers and surveyors were busy laying out the overall plan. What they saw upon arrival were a few plantation houses along Highway 116, the major road, running through the valley and connecting Hamilton, Georgia with Shiloh, Georgia, a distance of 12 miles. At about the six mile mark between the two towns, the center of Pine Mountain Valley Resettlement Village was established. What is now known as the Callahan Place, a two-story pre-Civil War plantation house, which still stands acted as the major administration office for the Valley Project. Of the pre-Civil War houses, just three miles to the west of the Callahan Place is the Tate House. It was in good repair when the project began and was used as a settler's dwelling. But most of the other houses in the Valley were old and had to be torn down as soon as possible. The one-room schoolhouse further shows the state of the valley's buildings, and much of the land was gullied and going back to pine and sweet gum forest. Hard times had settled on the valley. They loaded up the trucks with the people and they come out to, into the valley about five miles, past about three or four old houses, and then they got to this other, just past the second, third house. They pulled off to the side and stopped and at the edge of the blind thicket, and they had a whole bunch of rolled up canvas, which was tents, and tent poles out, and they, they told them they had to put those tents up or they gonna have to sleep on the ground. So they got the <laughs> tents up for dark, and the people they brought down for cooks, they had a mess started over there, got them started, and they put in the kitchen. Well, they and them lived in the tents for a while, they hauled, several old barracks from Fort Benning up here and put them back up and the first group moved out of the tents into the barracks because they had the mess hall in the kitchen in one of the barracks and the next group moved into the tents. The sheer number of tents and barracks provided a shelter for them and the photographs of the mess hall at meal time give some idea of the number of workers recruited for the initial labor all part of the back-to-work plan of the New Deal. While all of the old home sites had dug wells and water was in abundance in creeks and small streams, it was the large number of springs that dotted the valley that allowed a much easier start and successful finish to the project. 
Yet throughout the nation, some did not have wells or streams. We called them Aunt Rosa and Aunt, Aunt Rosa and uh, Aunt Dora. And if they had to have water, Aunt Dora had to come to our house and get it. And Daddy was always good at scaring people, and he was always slipping up behind her and scared and you'd think she's going to jump into that well sometime because we had to draw that bucket of water out of that deep hole there. One of the first springs to be used was the feeder spring to Palmetto Creek. It was beautifully rocked up with different catchments and basins. It was here that the first Pine Mountain Valley Fourth of July barbecue was held in 1935. It has been a tradition ever since. The initial decorative fence work is fairly typical of natural embellishment created in various camp and recreation sites throughout the country, reflecting the Adirondack style. It provided an ideal backdrop for family photographs. Near the base of Pine Mountain's south slope are two large artesian springs which still are the major suppliers of the valley's water. But a drilled well near the village center was soon in operation and still functions as a vital part of the valley's water system. Simultaneously with the well drilling and capping off of the springs, workers were busy laying the water line. Next came the establishment of the electrical substation, which boosted power enough for all the settlers' homes and run the mill workshop, the up-to-date dairy equipment, plus the auxiliary industrial buildings and plants. About 200 homes were planned, each of which to be bought by its occupying family. To facilitate the building of these homes, a very sophisticated woodworking shop was set up. Mr. Jack Huggins remembers the shop well. His brother worked there. He tells of a saw system that could cut many boards at once and at the correct angles, not just straight cuts. The saws were set per the specifications of the architect's plans. In a short while, the complete structural members of a house could be cut and delivered to the building site. Dozens of workers would begin assembling each house on a simple foundation of stone or brick pillars. The stone was taken from near the base of Pine Mountain, so from a truckload of lumber precisely cut from blueprint specifications, the framework of a house went up quickly. All of the houses had a central chimney. Initially, the chimney accommodated a fireplace with ventilators for the living room and a wood-burning cook stove for the kitchen. A heating coil inside the stove allowed water from an indoor tank to be heated as the cook prepared meals. One of the things I remember most is on Sundays, we would go to my grandmother's for Sunday dinner. Myself, my parents, all my cousins, aunts and uncles, and we would sit around the dining room table and eat Sunday dinner. And afterwards, everybody would help clean up the kitchen, and then we would go out and sit on the front porch, and we would sit there and talk. The kids, my, my cousins and I, would play in the yard until dark. And that, would, that brings back a lot of memories. We, we thought that was a really, really fine time. And we didn't need a, a lot. All of our toys were things that we had found on our rambles through the woods, or things that we made. Then when I was nine years old, my father, the, well, the project has bro had broken up, and my father got a job in Atlanta as the assistant building inspector for the city. So we had, to, we had to move when I was nine and leave my beloved valley, but we didn't sell the house. Few of the houses, however, are in their original form. Front porches have been enclosed or embellished. Others have had additions through the years, and some have been extensively renovated. Added to the excitement of being able to earn a new home, the settlers were also excited about being able to purchase furniture made in the woodworking shop, the same shop that cut the material for all the settlers' houses and dependencies. 
There were chairs, bedroom suites, tables, and utilitarian cabinets. In fact, the shop made just about anything a family might want, excepting stuffed furniture like sofas and chairs. Like any village or small town, there are a few large buildings that in many ways help define the place. Back when they was building the church, uh, they decided uh, that there wasn't enough of one denomination to build a Methodist church or a Baptist church. So they said, we'll all get together and we'll just build one church. The White House, Washington, May 19th, 1938. My dear Mr. Bennett, thank you ever so much for that grand little note you sent me on May 13th advising me of the desire of the congregation of the new community church of Pine Mountain Valley to name their new church in my honor. I am deeply touched by the thoughtfulness of the members of the congregation and shall feel greatly honored to have the new community church bear my name. With all good wishes, very sincerely yours, Franklin D. Roosevelt. Miss Emily and myself was uh, talking about all of the older people in the valley and uh, there was getting fewer and fewer of them so we decided we'd make a little book uh, about some of the early settlers and how the valley got started and how our church got started and <clears throat> so we I took her around and we interviewed a lot of the of the early settlers and, and their sayings and doings and uh, we have a picture of the church, and we we did a she did a a lot of work, and we had if you ever seen this book, you'll see a lot of the things that that we were we was doing in the book, and uh, it turned out real good, I think, and and I'm thankful for Miss M for for all the work that she did. And I remember Mr. Tumman. He had a song book and he would, it would always open and he'd have it out in his hand like this and he would keep time with the music and everybody was betting that one day he was going to fall off that podium up there. But he never did and he never lost the book. And it, it was bad about leaving the front doors open and dogs would come in and they'd have to shoo them all out. And so Mr. Mr. Russell said, Mr. Tumman said, I'll, I'll make an announcement in the morning that, you know, everybody's going to have to look after their dogs. You've got to keep them out. So just as Mr. Tumlin was saying, everybody needs to look after their dogs and keep them out of the church, here come his dog Tippy in. <laughs> so Mr. Tumlin had to stop and get his dog out of the church. We had a great community center. Uh, by the stretch of any imagination, it was the state of the art. It had a library. And this is where we first got our love for reading. It had a gymnasium, it had a, a projection room, it had movies, uh, it had classrooms, and it was a community building in the truest sense of the word. And I can remember at the old gymnasium, which a lot of the early people remember, it was a big, huge building. It was dust at that time. Uh, we had donkey basketball games up there. We had. They had a stage and they showed movies and they had plays and then they had a library there that you could go to and then in the back side they had a kitchen that you could have, I reckon, cookouts or whatever you want. The large general store or commissary, as it was called, owned and operated by the corporation, was like a shopping center of many people's memories. Mrs. Moy recalled that her father was in charge of the feed section of the store. Mama made all of my dresses for me to wear to school, but Daddy delivered feed, so we got to pick out the pattern that we wanted of the feed that he was going to deliver for our chickens and uh, cow, I guess, I don't know. Mm -hmm. Anyway, Mama made my dresses, but if, if uh, Daddy told her that somebody else had the same pattern, she'd go to the store and buy dye and dye it, so it'd be different. It didn't matter with me. We had all those feed sack dresses too because 
I'll tell you, they had some pretty, uh, pretty clothes, <laughs> clothes at that time. And in fact, I had saved some uh, of the sacks because when my I was pregnant with my first child, I made myself two maternity dresses out of those feed sacks. Perhaps the most imposing structures on the landscape were the three large barns. Sadly, the original barns burned early on because improperly cured oats were stored in them. Heat built in the core of the green oats, which caused spontaneous combustion. Everyone mourned the loss, but soon another barn was replicated and still stands on the Callahan property. But for some, like Mr. Bobby, the saddest thing was a loss far greater than the barns. A jack and a stallion that they'd use for breeding purposes. Of course, they had to keep them separated. The jack had a pen and wooden fence down there that he stayed in. And then they had a small barn and it had a hayloft above it that they kept the stallion in. Uh, one Saturday, and I don't know exactly what year it was, probably 39, somewhere in 40. The old shop up there where they worked on trucks and buying things caught a fire. And it had drums of fuel and stuff. And when they blew up, it blew fire over on the barn where the stallion was. Caught it on fire from the top, and it had hay in the loft, and it had a big chain. I mean, talking about a logging chain around the, with a huge padlock on it. And the person that had the key was was Mr. John Lip. He was also a kind of a veterinarian. He was off somewhere working on somebody's cow or horse or something, and nobody could get that to unlock the door to let the stallion out and the chain was too big and it couldn't break it open and the stallion perished there in that fire. And I was there, I remember what, I was eight or nine years old I guess, but for the years after that I could wake up at night and I could hear that horse screaming, you know, in, in my sleep. It, it, was, it was an awful sound and but they lost that beautiful stay in, the, in that fire. Many days you have lingered around my cabin door. All hard times come again no more. Dotted throughout the valley are numerous examples of what has become known as the Valley Barn. People are now recognizing both their practical and historical value and are thus restoring them. There is a new movement of settlers coming into the valley, several of whom are retirees. They are especially interested in restoring the barns and preserving the valley's history. There were also many chicken houses, since each place had at least one as part of the original plan. Few of the chicken houses remain, however. But the chicken houses played an important role in the settlers' lives. A family could provide not only eggs and meat for itself, but also could earn extra money by selling its eggs and meat to the corporation, which in turn could sell them to larger venues like the Fort Benning Army Post. Those were hard times in, in, the, in the valley. And we knew they were hard times, and so many, many times we were denied a lot of things because we just did not have the necessary funds to, uh, to purchase or to get the kinds of things that we needed. Many times during birthdays or Christmases, uh, they may be one or no toys. The greatest benefit, uh, I believe, that the Valley had not only on me, but the residents of that time, is a true work ethic that um, it was it was expected of you to to not only carry your load but also to pitch in and help your neighbor that's where we first learned to to uh,
to barter with each other. Someone had something you needed and you had something they needed and you would barter to get the services that you need. And it was, it was expected of you to help out when your neighbor was sick, to mend their fence, to milk their cow, to slop their hogs. Uh, and so the basic values of, that it takes to be a successful person in life uh, came from the Pine Mountain Valley Project. My, my folks was, were sharecroppers before they moved from Marietta, Georgia, down to Pine Mountain Valley. We came here uh, in 35 as my father as a field, one of the field foremen. See. And uh, of course his specialty was farming. And uh, it was tough times back then when, uh, when everybody in town was in the soup lines. We had plenty to eat because we grew our own food. And it taught everybody to be self-sufficient. I can remember when Ro President Roosevelt used to come down to Pine Mountain Valley when he'd be at Warm Springs. And, and they had a harvest festival here each year. And all the crops that they would raise, they would have them on display up at the old, old uh, school. vegetable garden provided enough fresh food during the growing season for immediate consumption plus enough for preserving for winter use. The commercial crops consisted of vegetables such as peppers and cabbage and sweet potatoes as well as the more traditional crops of corn and cotton. Surprises happen along the way when doing anything. One of the most surprising and most beautiful in working on this project is discovering after a year and two months into the project that at least one of their original parents is still with us and lives in a nearby town. When we lived, before we moved up there, my husband was farming with one of his uncles down at Casita, Georgia. And he worked all the year making, and I know it, my husband was not a lazy person. And at the end of the year, I remember this very well, he come when they settled out, he had us owing him five dollars or something and he wanted us to pay interest on the money. <laughs> I just thought that was, and that was his mother's brother. My husband's sister lived, well, at Eastport, Georgia, right at Atlanta. And it was in one Sunday's paper that they received, and she wrote us and told us about it and sent a picture of it. And my husband, I don't remember exactly how he got in touch with people in the valley, Mr. Bennett, but he did. And we were, it didn't take it long, you know, for us to get in. And I remember moving in, we had electric lights and an inside bathroom. That was very important. <laughs> had a nice big stove and hot water heater. I was happy there. I, uh, that was a good place to raise children. There were some activities, you know, they had an American Legion swimming pool there. My youngest son was born when we lived on B Street and he was born on D-Day and his daddy's birthday. And I told you about the president coming down. Heard that he was going to come down through the valley and we were sitting on the front porch. It was in the summertime warm weather, in the swing, the children, myself. And he came by in his convertible, of course he had a chauffeur, and Mr. Bennett, the valley manager, Tap Bennett was his name, he was in there, and of course they waved, and that was a highlight of the day. Every so often we used to have a, uh, uh, a tent, and in his tent there used to be movies. And all the movies basically were about cowboys. <laughs> 
And so all of us wanted to be cowboys. And so we would walk from our homes, three and four and five miles, up to that movie theater. And then at, at nighttime, we'd walk back home, and those of us who were really, really small and could not keep up with the larger children, they would run and hide, and we didn't know where they were. And so we did the same thing in camping. We used to camp a lot, just in anybody's woods, and uh, we small guys would, would uh, have to hunt our feller brothers and because we didn't know where they were. They'd hide from us and scare us, you know, all those different types of tales. So it was a great time growing up in Pine Mountain Valley as far as play and recreation, just free play, non-structured play. That was just a lot of fun, and you had to make up your own games. I rode my bike down to the Legion Hall pool every afternoon when it was hot in the summer, and that was a really neat experience to be able to do that. It was down on G Street. And we built playhouses in the old road bed right behind my house. There's an old, where the, bed, where the road used to go to Hamilton. And uh, we dug cabinets and shelves and tables and chairs out of the clay. And the old bottles and cans and plate shards that we found, those were our dishes that we, that we used. And we built huts up on the, up on the uh, wood, wood pile where the uh, pine trees were and we put the pine straw in the limbs and made huts. We did that sort of thing. I was visiting my cousins that lived down the street from us over on C Street and uh, their father and stepmother was gone that day so we decided we'd hitch the horses up to the just it was a wagon with just wheels, nobody. It was just the frame. Mm. And if you rattled paper behind the horses, they would run like crazy. So we got a paper sack and we sat back there and got them to run. And I fell off. <laughs> <laughs> so one that hadn't killed me. But we got them back home, got them stopped, got them back home, got them in the barn. Nobody was the wiser. <laughs> That American Legion swimming pool I was talking about. I can remember when they were building it, I used to slip off from home and go down there and sit and watch them build it. But we've had a lot of good times down there. A lot of these children in Pine Mountain Valley learned how to swim there. We used to play a lot of baseball. We even played the Fort Benning Doughboys when they had Major League ball players on their team. And we'd go to Fort Benning and play them. And, uh, that was while they still had the, had the uh, draft, and they draft those major league ball players and they put them on their baseball team. So we used to play Fort Benning Doughboys and that was actually playing major league ball players. We probably didn't realize it at the time how significant that would be, you know. As time went on, the Second World War come around and all our people went to, went to war, all my cousins and kin folks, and I was too young. As the families in the valley were reestablishing their lives and rearing their children in the best of circumstances, Europe was becoming more and more engaged in the growing war. Soon, America too would be drawn into this conflagration. It was with World War II and its aftermath that American life changed forever. A new industrialism and urbanization began. Money was more plentiful and to be had in the growing industries. Thus, new migration patterns were created in as many directions as there were centers of industry. Life and population shifted quickly from the little towns and farming villages to places like Detroit, Cincinnati, Mobile, San Francisco, and Seattle. It was this national shift that ultimately disbanded the government corporation that had created and helped hold together the Pine Mountain Valley Resettlement Village. In 1941, we moved in 37. In 1941, 
General Patton brought his, his his battalion through the valley, and it tore up the road. There was dust on the road, six inches deep. And as a tank broke down <clears throat> down at my Owen's house, mm -hmm. and I don't know whether Bobby got in it or not, but there was about four of us that, that lived in that tank for five days. Mama, Mama fed them for fed those three five soldiers for five days until they came up and, and drove that tank up, mm -hmm. up the hill to, to load it up. But they showed us everything on that tank except the stabilizer. They even let us shoot the machine guns on it. <laughs> we were about eight years old. <laughs> we thought that was the greatest thing that ever happened. My mother took me to LaGrange to the dentist and uh, we came back. We left early that morning and came back about, uh, I'd say, uh, about 11, 12, 11 o'clock now. And we got over there uh, about just the other side, going from the, just before we got back to uh, Pine Mountain. Well, and then it was Chipley. But, well, we looked up and we saw it just looked like the world was on fire. This just looked like smoke just, just above the mountain there. And, it, it, and we said, what in the world is going on? And we didn't have any idea. There were tanks right there on the top of the mountain. We said, what's going on? They said, well, we didn't mention too much what it was, but we said, the army. And, uh, and so we got on home, and uh, by all of that stuff, had to get way over on the side of the road. They were tearing up the road. It was as dry as you've ever seen when they came through there. I mean, just, it, was a, it hadn't rained in a long time. And, that's the, and the wind was blowing, and it was just coming up out of that thing, and it was, a, uh, I bet it was 2,000 feet in the air. And uh, we finally got down to the house, and uh, there was a, a tank parked right on the by driveway going into the thing. So my mother was really, um, she, she could not um, do anything with the, those soldiers. There were three of them in each tank. And so uh, she just said, well, now you're going to have to come down and eat meals with us because you're right here in my yard, our yard almost. And so they, they stayed there for five days and she had their meals. Like she got to know them she, like they were her own children. And, uh, and during the war, every one of them sent uh, letters to her almost every, every, say every two or three weeks. Wow. Until finally the last letter came and we just assumed that uh, they got wiped out over some way because they were fighting in uh, northern Africa, you know, that's where he went. Yes, I was youngest son was born on D-Day, 1944. My oldest brother was killed in action December the 12th, 1944 in the Philippines. I lost the first cousin on the other side in October of 1944. Mm. So, that was a sad thing that happened, you know, that I remember. Many days you have lingered around my cabin door. Oh, hard times come again no more. We sing the dream of all people. Hard times, hard times come again no more. That is the song of our hearts. Yet, even as we sing, hard times do come again. But as the children of the Great Depression have just shown, there is survival. Not just survival, but a triumph over such times. And we learn, we learn again and again the value of humaneness. How to help our neighbors. How to carry onward with our education how to be good citizens. We learn to make places where our children might be safe, places where they might play and touch the elemental pieces of both our individual and our communal lives. Here in this valley today, Pine Mountain Valley, a community was begun more than three quarters of a century ago. Of what the settlers of this place brought with them, those decades ago, of what our national government brought to this valley decades ago. So much remains today, both in our hearts 
and on our land. Incredible courage and vision and strength and respect. This film is an effort to piece together the fragile and ephemeral pieces of history into a coherent pattern, a story that might be worthy of passing on to future generations. Generations that will, in their strength, keep singing the song of hope. Yeah.